after the successful testing of the Dreadnought Gundam and the Gwaze Experimental Arms type, their data would be combined to develop two of the most powerful mobile suits of the war. The ZGMF X09A Justice Gundam and the ZGMF X10A Freedom Gundam. And since both machines were designed to work in tandem with one another, they would prove to be nearly unstoppable when doing so. The most famous of the two was without a doubt the heavily armed Freedom. Other than the Lakerta beam sabers, Lupus beam rifle and Xiphias rail cannons carried over from the experimental arms type, it also featured the M100 Balena plasma beam cannons on its wings. These were not just the most powerful weapons on the Freedom, but also some of the most powerful weapons ever to be mounted on a mobile suit, period. To drive all of these weapons then, the Freedom possessed a specialized targeting system called the Multi-Lock-On System. This allowed pilots with high spatial awareness to target and attack multiple enemies at once. In practice, the Freedom would often use this system in combination with its so-called Full Burst Mode, which simply meant that the Freedom was firing all of its weapons at once. But despite all of these heavy weapons, the Freedom was still a remarkably agile machine thanks to its wings. When these unfolded, the Freedom would enter something known as the High Mobility Aerial Tactics Mode, or High Mat Mode for short. As the name indicates, this mode gave the machine a big boost in mobility, turning it into a deadly dogfighting machine. And despite the name, it could also be used in space, where it would act in conjunction with its AMBAC maneuvering. Thanks to this, the Freedom could and would present a serious threat to enemy mobile suits, even at close range. All of this made the Freedom one of the most powerful mobile suits around, even well into the Second Bloody Valentine War. Unfortunately for Zaft, this immensely powerful machine was snatched away from them almost as soon as it was completed. To recapture it, Atherin Zala was assigned to its sister unit, the Justice Gundam, the more close combat oriented machine of the two. As with the Freedom, many of the experimental arms types as weapons were carried over, including the Lacerta beam sabers, Lupus beam rifle, and the refined version of the Fatum 00, the Justice's main and distinguishing feature that also gave it a lot of versatility. Other than a nice variety of weapons, it allowed the Justice to go into high mat mode by flipping it up. This granted the Justice incredible speed as well as increased mobility, similar to how the Freedom's high mat mode worked. In addition to this, it could also function as a traditional subflight system, but with a few extra tricks up its sleeve. All of its weapons remained usable through remote control, and even the whole backpack itself could be remotely controlled, allowing it to fight alongside the Justice, or in the worst case scenario, it could be used to ram enemies. A weapon then that wasn't tested out on the Gways were the two shoulder mounted beam boomerangs. Other than its combat role, another thing that set the Justice apart from the Freedom was the more powerful and also more prominent sensor array on its head, which was very similar to the one found on the Aegis. This most likely increased its data gathering and communication abilities, possibly hinting that this one would serve as the commander unit of the two. Also, just like the Freedom Gundam, the Justice did come with the multi-lock-on system, but Atherin would never use it with just the Justice Gundam. More about that in a second. Now, unfortunately for Zaft, they also lost this machine when Atherin decided to defect rather than carry out his mission. But things didn't end here. To support the twins, Zaft also developed a purpose-built carrier, the Eternal. 
As just a warship, it was armed relatively lightly with a single main gun, two double rail guns, and then a plethora of missile launchers, small beam guns, and sea whiz guns, but it more than made up for this in two ways. One, it was Zaft's fastest ship, even beating out the high-speed Nazca class. And two, of course, was its mobile suit complement and the special facilities designed to maintain and resupply them. This also included two special housings on the hull for two mobile suit embedded tactical enforcers, or meteors for short. These were weapon modules designed to dock with the Justice and Freedom Gundam, but when stored on the Eternal, they could also function as turrets, significantly increasing its firepower. Now, technically, it should be possible for non-nuclear powered mobile suits to also use these things, since they did have onboard batteries, but they were designed to also draw power from a nuclear powered Gundam, so it's very possible that the battery itself didn't last long. This would later on be rectified with Meteor Unit 5 and 6 by the Jung Guild, who retrofitted them with a nuclear reactor each and an N-Jammer canceller each. And this was probably very necessary to power all of the weapons on this thing. We have a whopping 77 60 centimeters Edinakeus anti ship missile launchers, two 93.7 centimeter high energy beam cannons, two 120 centimeter high energy beam cannons, and two MAX 200 beam swords. If there was anything before that the Justice and Freedom Gundam couldn't take on, they sure could now. And other than weaponry, the Meteor units also boosted their speed with engines designed after those of the Jin High Maneuver type. And because of this speed, the Meteor was also later developed into the Vern 35A MPFM multi-purpose flight module which was essentially a stripped down and streamlined version of the Meteor that acted as a booster for things like mobile suits, shuttles, and even fighter planes were being considered at some point. Originally, it didn't have any weapons, but some were later retrofitted by the Jung Guild. Also, originally this thing was going to be called the Meteor Kai. But back to the Eternal now. Unfortunately for Zaft, they would never get to use this as it was, again, stolen shortly after being completed. At some point after the completion of the Freedom and the Justice then, Zaft would begin research on their upgraded forms, called the Strike Freedom and Infinite Justice respectively. But again, unfortunately for Zaft, they would never get to use them because at some point during development, or shortly after completion, they were stolen by the Klein faction, again. Although considering how both units were fine-tuned to the operational preferences of the pilots who stole the original units, I feel that it's safe to assume that they were acquired at some point during development, and that they were then later finished by the Klein faction. The Strike Freedom continued the heavy artillery role of the Freedom by having upgrades of the previous weapons like the more compact and more powerful Xiphios 3 railguns, two MAM-21KF high-energy beam rifles, which could be either used individually or linked together for a more powerful long-range beam, and instead of the two wing-mounted plasma cannons, it now had a single Kalidus multi-phase beam cannon installed on its abdomen. In the wings then, it now had eight Dragoon pods controlled by the new Super Dragoon system. The big difference with the regular Dragoon system was that they no longer needed a pilot with high spatial awareness to use them. But despite this, it was claimed that they could only be used to their full effect by the so-called Ultimate Coordinator Kira Yamato, a claim that can most likely be disregarded as mere propaganda by the Klein faction who was operating this machine. But putting that aside, the Dragoons had a beam assault cannon each and could also emit a beam blade.
but despite their power, they did cause an issue with another system present on the Strike Freedom, the Voiture Lumière system. This system was mounted behind the Dragoons on the wings and granted the Freedom superior acceleration and agility. Because of the way it worked, the wings emitted light when the system was active, an effect affectionately known as the Wings of the Skies. While the Strike Freedom can use this system while the Dragoons are docked by slightly extending them, the system can only operate at full strength when they're launched. Which makes you wonder why the Strike Freedom launched with them equipped during battles on Earth. The Dragoons could only be used in space and, unlike those of the Providence and the Legend Gundam, they seem to have no special feature so that they could be used when docked. At least, not that we saw. Regardless, when using all of these weapons together, the Strike Freedom would enter the so-called Full Burst Mode, which would again be aided by the multi-lock-on system carried over from the regular Freedom. Another system that was carried over was the High Mad Mode, where the Strike Freedom unfolds its wings for better agility and aerial maneuverability. And what increased this already phenomenal agility even more was a new armor splitting system. While it did somewhat lower the unit's defensive capabilities, this was mitigated by installing phase shift armor on the exposed joints and by installing powerful beam shields on the forearms. And finally, the Strike Freedom could of course also dock with the Meteor units in case it needed even more firepower. The Infinite Justice then can be much more easily summed up. It's the Justice Gundam, but everything is better. Or in other words, by taking the combat data of the original Justice into account, the Infinite Justice was turned into the best close combat machine they could, something that was greatly reflected by its weapons. Not only did it come with standard beam sabers that could be combined into a beam staff, but it also had an MRQ-15A Griffin beam blade on each leg, inspired by the foot-mounted beam blades of the Aegis, and the MX-2002 Carrier Beam Shield, a shield that could not only emit a beam field, but also featured a grappling hook, the EEQ-8 Grapple Stinger, and the RQM-55 Shining Edge Beam Boomerang. And the same went for the Fatum-01. Thanks to the one Super Lacerta Beam Saber mounted on its nose, the pre-faced Lacerta Beam Saber mounted behind each of the Hyperfortis Beam Cannons, and the Griffin II Beam Blades mounted on each wings, the backpack no longer had to rely on just ramming enemy units, it could now instead slice them up, also giving the backpack a higher chance of making it back to the Infinite Justice in one piece. And in addition to all of these beam blades, it also featured two MA6J Hyperfortis beam cannons because it still needed some ranged weaponry. On the Justice itself then, we can find a pair of MMI GAU-26 17.5 twin Seawiz guns on the head, a pair of MMI M19L 14mm twin Seawiz guns on the chest, and finally a MAM-1911 high energy beam rifle that can also be stored on the back skirt. What also greatly improved its close combat performance was the same armor splitting technology as the Strike Freedom. And just as with that machine, phase shift armor was now installed on the joints to increase their defensive capabilities. And then finally, as with the original Justice, it had the multi-lock-on system, which was only necessary when docked with the Meteor unit, which it of course could and would still do. And before I wrap up this video, a quick fun fact about the Strike Freedom and the Infinite Justice. Did you know that they were originally going to be called the Super Freedom and the Night Justice respectively? Let me know down below which name you prefer. But that does it for the development history of the Freedom and the Justice, one of the most deadly tag teams in the history of Gundam. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more similar content. And one video you might want to immediately check out is the development history on the Gwaze and the Dreadnought Gundam if you haven't already because that essentially functions as a part one to this video. Anyways, 
As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters. I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time.